Thanks, Jim. And thanks, everyone, for coming in. Uh, question. Can you hear me OK? Yeah? OK, good. Uh, how many of you have APIs today? All right. And how many are currently building a ton of new APIs? Good. How many are actively managing those APIs? One person, I see two. That's what I kind of guessed. So if you, yeah, feedback. That's what I kind of guessed. Everyone has some APIs. Everyone's building new ones. And very few are actually managing APIs actively today. And there's huge benefits that you can get out of managing your APIs consistently and effectively so that your developers your app developers can consume them in a nice way and, and develop more apps. That way you sell your products. And that's much more business for you. So that's, that's, that's the goodness of managing APIs. And we'll walk through how we do that uh, with the Cisco integration platform as part of this presentation. OK? Now, with the rise of all these technologies, and we've heard these technologies for a while, you know, mobile, social, cloud, all of that stuff, a lot of businesses are innovating stuff. Now, if you think of the classic example of Uber, everyone knows that Uber works. It just works. Their first phase was their own app, and that's all they had. After that, they started integrating into Google Maps. And that gave them, gave them a million hits a day just because they were on the map. And when you search for directions from point A to point B, you could click on get me an Uber to, to get me there. And that's, that was effective. And then they expanded it further to allow for you know, apps like the Yelp app to say, OK, I'm going to this restaurant. Get me an Uber. Now, taxi companies have existed for a long time. None of them thought about this. This is all API driven in some ways. Right? And if you think about what Uber did, it, it flipped it over saying, OK, we have this cool app, but then integrating it with other APIs on, in the ecosystem and creating this full ecosystem, which is very effective, was a great way to get their product in some ways out there. Uh, now, you can even, like if you have a United app on your phone, you can actually say, pick me up from my home, take me to the airport, from the airport, Uber me to wherever I'm going. Now, Hertz, Enterprise, all these car companies have been around forever. They've had partnerships. Like, your United Club card can actually get, get points with, with, an, with a Hertz car, for example. They've not integrated that app yet. And that's where they fail in some ways, in my opinion, in integrating with APIs. They haven't managed that transition very cleanly. If you, if you look at the companies that have done it effectively, You'll see that you know half of Salesforce revenue, that's a huge company. Half of it comes from APIs. That's it. Two billion dollars in, in Expedia revenue coming from APIs. Uber completely built on top of APIs. So there is goodness to it. And what you guys are doing, I, I saw that a lot of people are creating new APIs. That's a good thing. I mean, you're, you're going to change quite a bit of what's going to happen in the world. And my guess is most of you are doing the APIs because of you know, there's growth in new markets, there's innovation happening, there's the mobility stuff that's happening. And there's a lot of reasons to expose your APIs in a way that uh, developers can consume them in an effective manner. Now, you can create all the APIs you want. If you haven't exposed them cleanly, you lost it anyways. Even at Cisco, I'll be the first to admit that I used to have a ton of APIs on my previous products. Uh, and we would create PDF docs, you know, 50,000 pages of PDF docs that nobody used, except the one person that asked for the API that used it. And they had a pain in, in figuring out what needed to be done. They came back to me all the time. So uh, I should have introduced myself, by the way. I'm Jaydeep Subedar. I've been at Cisco for about 15 years in various capacities, uh, mostly in product management, but in routing, switching, unified communications, data center, and finally in my current role in application platforms group. So this is my first role in managing APIs, really. And, and I have kind of a uh, role that, which spans enabling all of Cisco to consume APIs or create APIs effectively. So you'll see more and more of the Cisco API platform being used for exposure of Cisco APIs. So you'll see Cisco APIs being much better documented, as well as creating this product portfolio and, and, and taking this product to the market. Now, I'm not going to talk about the product too much today. But I'll tell you the philosophies behind what we've done with the product. Okay. 
When you think of the API and AMP ecosystem, there's two parts to it. There's the production of APIs and there's the consumption of APIs. And the production, this is where most companies are. This is, even for Cisco, we, we produce a ton of APIs. Some APIs are managed, this needs to increase a whole lot, and we'll see why. These are consumed by apps, and the apps need an app marketplace. So my group is involved in creating some apps, some seed apps using Cisco APIs, and creating the app marketplace as well. So we're, we're in the process of doing that today. On this, in this talk, we'll mostly concentrate on the API management piece. Okay. So what's our vision for this platform? To create, to provide developers a seamless API experience with consistency in, in exposing your APIs with, uh, across the entire ecosystem of all the APIs that an enterprise has. In my case, it's Cisco. In your case, it would be your companies that are exposing the APIs. And, in, and that translates to the strategy very cleanly where, at least for Cisco, enable a Cisco Unified API Management Platform that supports this ecosystem with a consistent frame of reference. And I'll, I'll walk you through what we've done there. Before I do that, let's look at what's changing in APIs. If you look at the API journey, ever since 2000 and even prior to that, there have been APIs, they were just not documented, they were not called APIs because it was a different language that we spoke. But if you look at it, we had internal APIs within products, within teams. Then we, around 2004 or so, some of them were externalized. You started seeing some of the Cisco APIs being published. Around 2008, there was some standardization there was the SOAP interfaces starting to go rest, and today the world has, has pretty much come to rest, and rest has become the standard. There's a ton of APIs already on rest. And, and currently and going forward, the challenge is not creating the APIs, creating the standards, SOAP, rest, whatever else. It's scaling them, and it's scaling exponentially. I mean, if you look at how, how products are being consumed, it's mostly around Okay, how do I use your APIs effectively to consume your product? It's no longer about how do I consume your product by itself. It's through the APIs that you consume the product. Now, all of this comes with challenges at every stage. Now, I'm going to concentrate more on, on, on the right. Okay, there's a lot of hum, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let's, let's get the AV fixed. OK? All right. So today, we need to, so the challenge is, is the scaling and enabling everyone to do the bi, uh, bimodal development. And by, by bimodal, I mean, so that there's the classic developers who are used to the, the way of consuming product, consuming APIs, they're the nerds who program stuff. And they know how to do this stuff. There is also the second crowd that is emerging, which is, Kind of the consumerish crowd that doesn't necessarily understand everything about everything in terms of programming, and they're just using the systems. And in order to use the systems effectively, you want to make sure that you're providing them something that they can use effectively, rather than you know, the 50,000 pages of documentation we used to have. If you throw that at somebody who is new to this world, they will throw your product away, saying this product does not support APIs. It, it comes to that essentially. Right? So in order to do all of that. And, and do the challenges, or take care of the challenges, tackle the challenges, we have a simple design philosophy. And it basically translates to this. But before I get there, there's one, one point of information which is very interesting. 70% of cost of a product is creating the API ecosystem and the, the API itself. I mean, and this is a Gartner study, not Cisco, but Gartner says that Teams have been working a whole lot in exposing APIs effectively, yes, but 70% of the whole project cost of building the product and the API, 70% of that is really building the API. And, and we learned today how to, how to reduce that cost significantly with the platform. And right behind this is, is my demo. I can show you how, how we propose one way of doing it. It's, it's, it's a very easy way to do. There's a platform that, that you can consume today, and we can demo it on, on how to do that, how, how to go about doing it. So here's. So coming back to the original topic, here's why you need APIs. And, and I'll let you read through it, glance through it. But fundamentally, you want to make it consistent across your full breadth of APIs. You want to make it simple. And you want to make it so that they want the, your customers want to consume your APIs. Right? It's fundamentally that. And, and then there is, 
the other the other parts of monetization, for example, today most APIs are not monetized. Except if you if you talk to Salesforce, yes, they monetize their APIs. Netflix monetizes their APIs. But there's not a whole lot of companies doing that today. And your company might be one of those that could do that. There's ways to do it. There is reasons to do it. Uh, fundamentally, if you, if you think of monetization, for example, if you if you're thinking of the whole API uh, life cycle, there are times when you have the secret sauce, at which point you are the only one who has it, and that's when you would monetize. But it's a sliding scale. As, as soon as your com competition gets it, or you see that that API is not core to your product anymore, you can slide it to, OK, we'll make it kind of free. And there's a whole scale in between where you can, you can change pricing on the API as you need to, depending on how your business evolves, as well as how your customers evolve, as well as how competition evolves. So there's various aspects to, to doing this stuff. And th that'll be up to you on how to monetize your APIs or not, where you are in the life cycle of your API, where your competition is, and all of that stuff. OK? Uh, so let's, let's look at what, what we've delivered on the product. And what we've delivered is management governance and its benefits. And you'll see that on, on how. And this is how we see the whole API lifecycle go. It, it starts with defining an API, where you say, this is how my customers are going to consume my asset. You don't have to even develop it. You can just say, de define the API as, as it is today. Ask your customers, is this good? And the platform allows you to do that. So I'll, I can show you a demo after, right after this if you, if you stop by. And, OK, how, you, how, do, how do you want, want to consume my product, Mr. Customer? You, you start working in the design define phase for doing that. Next, you develop that API and the backend systems to support it. Beyond that, you publish your API, and you might want to govern access to it. You might want to govern who gets to see it, how much they get to use it. So for a gold level customer or a platinum level customer, you might say, OK, Mr. Customer, you can see this API, and you can uh, do 1,000 transactions a second, because you pay us a whole lot. You're, you're allowed to do that. Now, for a silver level customer, you might say, you can only do 500 transactions a second. You can't do much any more than that. That's not allowed. And you need to be able to govern that. And the platform allows you to do that. And for, for a free customer, you might say, OK, you can do 10 transactions a second, and, and you're OK. That's all you can do. You can't do any more than that. So that's in the publish phase of things. Then there is support, which is, how do you onboard all your ISVs, all your app developers? How do you make sure that everything comes cleanly to them in, in a single frame of reference? Uh, how do you provide them examples that are meaningful to them in a programmatic fashion so that it, they don't need to read the documents for examples? They can actually see the API in action. And then, of course, there's a retire phase where you want to make sure that you manage your APIs cleanly so that they're not uh, getting you know, killed before the customer expects them to be killed. There are ways to message that through the API itself or through the platform, controlling access, cleanly transitioning to the next version or the next API set. And you want to make it so clean that they, the end apps don't get affected as much as possible. Okay. So now if you look at this life cycle, the define, develop, publish, support, and retire, you can look at it in three frames. There is business frame, there's the operations frame, and the technology frame. OK? Now, on the business frame, when you're getting in the, in the define phase, for example, you're trying to get feedback as much as possible from your customers on what they want to do. As a result, you're driving business results right there, rather than saying, hey, here's my API. Here's the definition. Go use it. Figure out how to use it. Do what you like. This is all I can do. Instead of that, you're now having a two-way conversation on, on, what, on what's possible uh, to do. At, at the, even, even before you started developing your product, you could do that. On the operational frame, you're saying, how do I manage all these APIs and define them consistently across my product portfolio or across my company's product portfolio? So there are ways to look at other assets within your company and, and try and make things consistent as much as possible for your customers. And then there's the, the technical frame where you want, to be, you want to make sure that it's consistent across. You are doing a customer-centric design for the technology behind that design. And you want to make sure that you don't have three methods to do the same exact thing that could have been done by one, slightly different, doing things slightly differently on one versus the second versus the third. Uh, uh, customers get bugged with that a whole lot, saying, why are you doing the same thing in three different ways? And, and we hear it at Cisco as well, where you know, we have 
20 ways of doing uh, the same exact API. We're trying to consolidate that con and make it consistent as much as possible. In the develop phase, we allow for rapid prototyping, where you can start de uh, defining and developing your API right on the platform. And you can start doing the trials. There's something called the mock service, where even before you, you develop the back end of systems of your actual product, you can showcase what the API does and allow it to be hit from the, from the outside by an app, and it'll return back what you programmed as a sample data or a sample output of, of the API command. So you could do gets or posts or whatever else, and it'll, it'll respond with samples. Again, in the operational frame, that allows you to do you know, uh, the infrastructure management piece, where you know how much of API consumption will happen, how to size your gateways or the proxies that go be between applications and, your, and your, actually, your actual backend, you know kind of what kind of loads to expect there. And again, in, in the technical frame, again, it's, it's consistent development for the technology behind it. I'm going to skip the rest, the public support and retire. Uh, happy to talk about it offline, just because we're running out of time a little bit. Now let's just look at how, within my group, how we've used this philosophy to, to do an app. Now when you do apps, the typical apps that, that we're used to are application to application APIs, or infrastructure to infrastructure. Cisco has been fantastic at infra to infra stuff. On the app to app stuff, it's mostly the consumer companies that have done. No one has done yet application to infrastructure. And that's what the, our app does, and it does it very effectively. Actually, we are demoing it right behind this booth, or right behind this classroom. I can, I can walk you through that as well. So on the left here, what you see is there's some services that are exposed. There are Cisco assets, for example, where it could be you know, data center assets, networking assets, security, all of that stuff. And on top is the business applications. And in between is the platform that allows for all of these to communicate together. So in some ways, this is infra at the bottom, apps at the top, and this is where the bandwidth on demand app that I'm going to just show you in the next slide talks about how to do application to infrastructure. And that's, that's going to evolve over time. I mean, this is just the first app that we've done. But I'm sure there are use cases in, in your particular companies that could leverage this. So in our case, we call this the four-layer architecture. But there's the infrastructure piece, there's the controllers, and you heard enough about it at Cisco Live on all the infrastructure and all the controller components. What you haven't heard about is how do you integrate these pieces, the integration platform, with your apps? And your apps could be you know, something like a Salesforce, for example, or an Oracle database. So in this example, what we've done in, in the app, and again, you can stop by for a demo right after, is it's a service provider app in this example, where a service provider exposes uh, a frame to its, its customer saying, here, this is, these are all the network devices that you have, or these, these are all the locations that you have. Between any of these locations, if you need to bump up or bump down bandwidth, you just click saying, between New York and San Francisco, I want 20 megs of bandwidth between midnight and 6 a.m. on Fridays because I'm doing a backup job at that time. Now, when you do that, you go next, what, it, what the system does is figures out, okay, is that bandwidth possible with the current network and what has been planned on this network across the United States, uh, whether that, that's possible or not. It figures that out looking at multiple aspects of things. It looks at databases on top saying, okay, does this customer have enough dollars in my account? Is this, is this customer authorized to do like a 20, a 20 meg pipe or a 10 meg pipe? And second, is the network capable of delivering that between midnight and 6 a.m., or is another customer using up that pipe and I don't have that capacity at that point of time? So again, it's looking up databases, looking up network. Sage figures out that you do have enough bandwidth available at that time. What it's gonna do next is it's gonna go there and uh, say, okay, I'll provision it. 11.59 p.m., it goes and provisions the network and writes in another database saying, yes, this was provisioned. 6 a.m. after that period is done, it goes and bumps down the bandwidth from 20 to 10 meg or whatever that original bandwidth limit was, and then writes into the billing database saying, okay, bill this customer for this 10 megs for six hours. It does all of that, 
And it's only possible if you have an architecture like this, where you're abstracting the network and the controllers and all of that stuff that Cisco drives from the applications on top. And only when you do that, you can say, OK, these controllers are changing, these devices are changing, but your customer doesn't care. Your customer doesn't care that you, you deployed Nexus switches or the latest and greatest and semi ACI style of switches. All they care about is, hey, give me the bandwidth. And that's what this app allows you to do. You can change the infrastructure below it, change the controllers if you need to, and the service keeps running. So that's, that's the power of you know, using the, the platform in between and using APIs, northbound and southbound, to integrate all of this together. Let's look at, so in effect, what this gives you is, is consistent API management, consistency in how you utilize your resources, how you expose your resources, make your developers effective. Now, exposure is another thing that if you publish them cleanly, people want to consume your, your assets. And then again, standardized documentation, they know how to interact with you, whether they're using API 1, 2, 3, 4, or 500, it doesn't matter. What, what API it is, it is consistent from your company's frame of view to the customer. So in effect, it's simple, smart, and secure. I mean, we have the layers of security built in. Uh, Cisco, is, of course, has to be secure stuff, so we do that. Any questions on any of the stuff that I've talked about? It's time to move. It's time to make business happen. Here's an action plan for all of you here, OK? Ask me for a demo right outside. Anytime I'm here today and tomorrow. Check out the platform online. Email me. Here's my email ID, jdeep at cisco.com. Very simple. My first name at cisco.com. And this year, think through how you're going to develop your API and app ecosystem so that it's consistent. That will result in financial benefits for your company. It can get you out there. And there will be another success story that I can talk about next year, hopefully, at Cisco Live. You come back and tell me, hey, this is what how my world changed, and I'll talk about you guys. Let's do that together, right? Any questions at all? Nothing. All right. I w either I was super effective or I put you to sleep. Anyways, enjoy your amplification. Thanks for coming in. Cheers. Thank you.